Hello, welcome to my series on computer science and computer science integration pedagogies. My name is Yu Hongsun. I'm one of the MLTI 2.0 ambassadors. My job is to work closely with the Moodle digital learning specialists and the other MLTI 2.0 ambassadors to provide instructional technology coaching, create and deliver professional learning. This is me in my Bitmoji. I'm very excited that you could join me in exploring some of the effective pedagogies in teaching computer science and integrating computer technology into K-12 curriculum. This is the fourth video of the series on computer science and computer science integration pedagogies. My previous topics include computational thinking skills development, engage students through contextualized learning, and building critical thinking and problem-solving skills through collaborative learning. If you are looking to receive contact hours, please follow the link in the description of each video. Today's topic is teaching away from a computer or computer science unplugged. It will cover what is teaching away from a computer or computer science unplugged, how to develop students' computational thinking without a computer, examples of teaching away from a computer, what are the benefits of teaching away from a computer, Today, I invite four MLTI 2.0 ambassadors to talk about their experiences of how to develop students' computational thinking without a computer or computer science unplugged. They were all teachers, and their experiences are directly from their classrooms. This is Joshua Schmidt, a math teacher from China Middle School. Jonathan Wallen, a technology integrator from Cape Elizabeth Middle and High Schools. Nicole Kerot, a science teacher from Mount Ararat Middle School. Tracy Williamson, a music teacher from Gorm Middle School. Teaching away from a computer or computer science unplugged is a teaching method to teach students computer science concepts and computational thinking skills without using a computer. It makes lessons engaging and accessible to a variety of learners. According to Bell Witten in 1998 and Heinz in 2019, the term computer science unplugged originated in a series of activities published online and later assembled into a free online book. It was originally intended as an outreach tool to explain computer science concepts to young students without learning programming first. It is now used in a variety of contexts due to the fact that computer science and the computational thinking are part of the K-12 curriculum around the world. Therefore, the computer science unplugged approach has gained popularity in the classrooms. According to csunplugged.org, CS Unplugged is a connection of free teaching material that teaches computer science through engaging games and puzzles that use cards, string, crayons, and lots of running around. When CS Unplugged, students use their knowledge to work computational thinking challenges that will help them understand the concepts they will use in computer science projects. Computational thinking was first brought up by Jeanette Wing's paper, Computational Thinking, in 2006. According to Jeanette Wing in 2006, computational thinking 
is a thought process involved formulating a problem and expressing its solutions in such a way that a computer, human, or machine can effectively carry out. It is a fundamental skill for everyone, not just for computer scientists. To reading, writing, and arithmetic, we should add computational thinking to every child's analytic ability. The fundamentals of computational thinking consists of decomposition, abstraction, algorithm, and pattern recognition. In the past decades, computational thinking has become one of the driving factors in the reform of the K through 12 education, and it has become an important part of the curriculum. To help students better understand computer science and build computational thinking skills, the computer science unplugged approach has been experimented and implemented. The computer science unplugged approach intends to teach computer science concepts and computational thinking skills without using any computers. The unplugged approach has generated interest instantly. The idea is that we don't need computers to build computational thinking skills, but we can use computational thinking skills to solve a problem. Why is the CS unplugged approach popular in classrooms? For students, they find that computer science concepts are hard to understand. According to Gu Style in 2015, the inhumanness of computers makes them harder to understand. For teachers, they find it challenging to help students understand computational thinking, such as algorithm, decomposition, pattern recognition, abstraction, logic reasoning, etc. In order to address these challenges, computer science unplugged strategy was implemented. The strategy involves the use of hands-on and practical activities to help students understand how computer works and the key concepts of computer science. According to Tim Bell, having activities away from computers is effective. Because children generally know the computer as a toy or tool, rather than the subject of study in itself, by stepping away from the computer, they are able to think about issues that computer science face beyond simply programming. According to csunplugged.org, the goal of CS Unplugged. Is to provide a mechanism for teachers to exchange ideas, including teaching methods and ways to integrate computer science activities into curriculum. It is an unusual approach to expose students to the ideas and the concepts of computer science without using computers. The unplugged activities involve critical thinking and problem solving to achieve a goal, and to explore fundamental concepts of computer science. In the CS unplugged model, teachers use physical visual aids to support the learning and to promote computational thinking skills. The other teaching aids include video demonstrations, a show, outdoor events, hands-on activities, board games, field trips, paper and pencil, puzzles that use cards, string, crayons, and a lot of running around. You can find a lot of resources on the website of csunplugged.org. CS Unplugged. Is a connection of free teaching materials that teaches computer science through engaging activities. It is a great place to learn and help develop the CS unplugged activities into curriculum. The important connection between computational thinking and CS unplugged material 
is to match the computation thinking elements with the computer science unplugged activities, and to ensure that the activities can be applied effectively to help students understand computer science concepts and develop their computational thinking skills. CS Unplugged was intended to help students to understand what a computer scientist does, and computational thinking is to think like a computer scientist. Matching unplugged activities with computational thinking ideas is important because they both should serve the same purpose. Computational thinking is just a fancy word. The meaning is quite familiar to teachers everywhere. Let's take a look at the meanings of the four core elements of computational thinking: decomposition, breaking a problem into manageable subproblems; algorithm, a set of well-defined steps to solve a problem or perform a computation; abstraction. Identify the relevant and essential details to solve a problem. Pattern recognition to identify patterns in a data set to characterize process and resolve that information more effectively. Teachers from different disciplines are developing students' computational thinking all the time in their classrooms by using computer science unplugged. Here are some examples. Hi, Yu Hong. Just like how a lot of people think that computational thinking has to be done on a computer. My students would frequently think that equations had to be done the way that you do them in a math classroom. So when my students would hear, "Hey, we're going to do a project about equations," they would think we're going to be solving something like two x plus three equals eight. One of my favorite ways to teach equations to my students was using pattern recognition and computational thinking in a project called the Snap Hotel. We would give them 50 snap cubes with a specific set of rules, and the student's job was to figure out the cost, expense, and profit of each hotel. We would then use that information to try to create the best hotel possible. So when we started with the project, I would give them a few sample hotels and would ask them, "Which of these do you think has the highest profit?" We would then go through the process of the equations, working them out by hand. And figuring out how to do the calculations ourselves. Then, when we had the opportunity, we would go back to the computer and create the calculator on Google Sheets. When the students were fully done, they would then 3D print their final solution as well. And what I really loved about this project is how it showed my students that when we work with stuff in the real world, you use these same skills and processes from a classroom. But it's going to look a little bit different, and so understanding that pattern recognition, that computational thinking, and solving those equations can help you do some really cool stuff. So in music class, we incorporate basic computational thinking when we work with musical form and repeating patterns.、Um, that could be students playing patterns or composing patterns. In sixth grade music, we do a whole unit on bucket drumming, where we really dig into rhythm and rhythm notation. Music notation itself is a mathematical pattern associated with time duration. So longer length notes are divided into smaller durations, and each subdivision takes the previous duration and cuts it in half. So, for instance, a whole note lasts for four beats, and if you take that symbol and then you add a stem to it, the duration is then cut in half. And the note lasts for only two beats, so two half notes equals the same duration as one whole note. We keep progressing through quarter notes, eighth notes, sixteenth notes, thirty-second notes, and so forth. So when students are playing or composing music, they need to make sure that there are the correct notes to equal the number of beats that the music needs. So students need to figure out how to fit them together like a puzzle in order for the music to make sense and fit into a time frame. 
In addition to rhythm, music notation represents pitch when it's placed on a music staff. So as a note is placed higher or lower on the music staff, the pitch represented by the placement of the note is respectively higher or lower. So when you look at written music, you should be able to audiate or hear those notes in your head without actually making a sound. Um, the kids are always amazed when I can look at a piece of music and know exactly what it's going to sound like or what they need to fix or something like that without actually making a sound or hearing that music being played out loud. Once students have an understanding of rhythmic notation, they have the opportunity to compose their own pieces. So we do these compositions in basic tertiary form or ABA form. Most music has some kind of form to it where the sections of the piece repeat in some way or relate to each other in some way, and we can analyze different forms and then emulate them. Usually students start learning from um, in elementary school with like call and response style songs or rounds, something very simple, and then we add in more complicated form as we progress. So what we do, we just talk about ABA form, what it is, what it means in terms of their rhythm compositions that they're going to make. They need to have a series of notes that equals four measures, and then they have to come up with a contrasting series of notes. So that's going to be their B section, and then repeat the original series to create the ABA form. So once they've composed and they practice, they perform their compositions with a live group. So they have the opportunity to write the form, then they're physically playing the form, and then and their end goal is this, this performance piece. Sometimes we add choreography to it too. So there's there's a lot of movement involved and students really get the concept of that that pattern. Um, so this and this is all accomplished without the use of technology at all, completely away from the computer. The music is all handwritten. They're using hands on instruments you know, that they find in the music room. We actually use the stage to perform for the class. So we, we really put a huge performance aspect on this. We do later apply this to uh, these concepts to compositions using Soundtrap on their iPads and laptops. With the aid of this um, additional technology, we're able to do those more complex forms. So uh, using Soundtrap, they not only create an ABA form composition, they also do ABACA, so Rondo form. And then we've tried some other, um, other kinds of forms. Like one year, we did a collaboration with PE, actually for a couple of years we did that and students had to create a soundtrack for a Tabata workout because the Tabata workout is a four minutes um, workout where you have 20 seconds of high intensity exercise alternated with 10 seconds of resting. So what we did was we had students choose a whole bunch of different high intensity activities, whether it was, you know, jumping jacks or running in place or whatever, and then they had to compose music to match each of those. So whatever they chose for their exercise ended up becoming the form because if they repeated an exercise then that section of music also had to repeat. And it ended up being really cool. The kids recorded their, uh, did a video recording of themselves doing their Tabata workouts. And then when they went to PE, the PE teacher was actually playing the music out loud. He would choose like one each day and the kid, the whole class would get the opportunity to do the activity along with it. So these are just a few examples of ways that students are practicing computational skills in other content areas, particularly music, and away from their computers. Hi there, I'm Jonathan Werner. I'm one of the eight MLTI 2.0 ambassadors in my second year, and when I'm not at the Department of Education, I am the tech integrator at Cape Elizabeth Middle School. When Yuhang asked me to talk about my experience with analog coding. I was delighted to do so. And the first person that came to mind for me was my friend, Tom Charles Trey. Tom was the uh, tech integrator at Cape El Elizabeth's um, Elementary School, Pond Cove, for several years. And during that time, he hosted an event called the Hour of Codes Coder Express. Coder Express was based on the Polar Express and had a whole winter cookie hot cocoa theme. Um, it brought in parents and kids of the elementary school students from all over the community, hundreds of them for several of the years, and really gave them an opportunity to explore coding from the perspective of a kid teaching their parents or older kids teaching younger kids some of the skills. So. Some of the analog activities we did at that event were terrific, and I thought I'd share those with you, plus a few other resources you might want to explore. Tom's kids decorated for the event, and his fourth graders formed something called the E-Team. The E-Team organized the event. They taught throughout the year 
younger students and teachers how to use technology. But I also worked with an e-team at the high school and my students mentored his students and his students in turn ran this activity. Um, you can see they decorated for the North Pole theme of the book um, and I'm welcoming there in that somewhat grainy picture the young man who's joining the activities. During the pandemic, they were able to extend this and it, many of these activities work really well for remote instruction if that's necessary at some point. Um, through the support of the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation, they sent home tons of bags of Coder Express kits, which included many of the items we'll talk about. And as they did that, um, they had the opportunity then to have some synchronous sessions as a part of it and the e-team was available in a help room for much of it. So that was a terrific way to sort of build the community um, during that period of distancing and also demonstrated the portability of a lot of these events. And you can see Tom right there delighted to be taking this picture of his students and one of his parents. Falmouth has taken up the um, banner of Hour of Code as well. And you can see these students participating in the dance party that I'll describe to you in just a moment. Um, you can see uh, adults and teachers and parents all joining their kids as part of these activities and the whole crew getting really into the event, which I thought was delightful. They have elves that welcome you at the door. They had various table stations where they explored both analog and digital opportunities. You had older students mentoring younger students and siblings, and then these delightful guys having you come in. You can see the ticket in his hand as well. So the first of these activities is something called the Coding Cup. If you check out on YouTube either the Coding Cup Challenge or you can search Steam Challenge Cup Coding, you'll see two different versions of how this has been run. But basically what you're doing is creating a series of commands and you can do this one of two ways. Either you use these cards and you lay them out for someone to try to build the structure that you have in mind, but you can't speak. Or you can show them the cards one at a time and have them build it in real time. But it is hilarious to watch and especially difficult to watch the first student try to control his or herself and not uh, speak. So here you can see some of the challenges. So the student who's asking the other student to code has the challenge and the other individual is stacking the cups. You can check out curriculum.code.org slash HOC for Hour of Code slash Unplugged. There are six activities there that the first of which begins with My Robotic Friends and it's an opportunity for kids to work uh, against the clock to try to program their, uh, their classmates or their uh, fellow students to do particular moves and particular sort of poses as a part of it and it is hilarious and a very sweet thing to see. And then if you check out code.org slash learn, the updated version of that same site um, has a bunch of possibilities. If you search no computer or devices in the lower left there, you'll come up with Dance Party, the one I just described. Binary co code, where the activity has students translating particular phrases after they learn how binary code works into either name tags or bracelets, and they've done it as sound as well, which is really neat. And you can see that each of these activities has a link that will take you to that particular information if you'd like. The 50 centimeter race from Ozobot. Ozobot is a tiny bot that follows a path that is drawn, and the various colors have different reactions on the part of the Ozobot, and it is a terrific and quite inexpensive device um, to teach coding and how robotic uh, instruction is created from code. In this case, the really simple version of changing colors and you trace a line and it follows that line along the page. Then we have a program simulator and this is where we have a, what they call pseudocode and it's just a basic um, coding process that allows students to try to instruct the other person to work their way through a paper maze. So the thing that's interesting about various versions of it is the one kid frequently cannot see the maze. So the one who can see it is directing his blindfolded friend, or sometimes they do it like with a, a piece of cardboard blinding them, um, completing the, the tasks um, by the directives provided by the other student. And you can search uh, Ozobot Program Simulator. 
And then finally, um, CS First Unplugged from Google has terrific activities. And if you notice here, um, that website will take you to a handout. The first of these is Network and Neighborhood. It helps you understand how Google Maps works or any mapping software. And the goal is to have students and their families figure out the shortest routes that connect every building. The second is encoding an emoji where they're given a grid of five by five or seven by seven. And then one student has the emoji image and the other student figures out various ways to share it with them. So you can see that there's some numerical ways to do it. You can do it with black, white, white, black, but the activity responds really nicely to whatever age group you're working with. And then finally in this, the secret message where you are using this device that is cut out and you create it with two pieces of cardboard on top of each other and they spin to indicate where the letters and numbers line up and as you can see on the lower left hand side there using key number six you translate from the encrypted message to the decrypted message coding is cool you might check out www.csunplugged.org they have terrific activities there also some expansions on the ones i mentioned and finally, there was a prior version of this, which they now refer to as classic.csunplugged.org. And they have some terrific activities that really work nicely for a whole range of uh, student ages and several videos to show you how they work um, in real time if you'd like to watch people undertake those. Thanks so much. Hi, my name is Nicole K. Rod, and Yu Hong asked me to talk about abstract thinking today. I'm putting my email here if anybody wants to reach out. So according to the Resilient Educator, abstract thinking is about finding different perspectives and ideas related to a topic. Since every individual will see a topic in a different light, a discussion can open the door to deeper thought and processes. So how do we do this? In my science classroom, I look at the big picture, real world connections, and a context that students can grasp. So here are some examples. So when I think about big picture, a lot of the times I'm giving them the 20,000 foot view. So looking at our overarching goals so that when we talk about our um, learning standards, I'm talking about physics and chemistry and ecology and where things fit in. Then also thinking about the real world context. So when my students are doing science, we're not just doing it in a test tube. We're not just doing it um, isolated as a simulation on the computer. They're actually doing things in real life. So uh, up in the corner here on the right, you can see my students playing mini golf to apply physics concepts. What happens when this ball is hit on a carpet versus the tile? Um, down in the bottom, you can see them apply chemistry concepts uh, to make uh, tie-dye. So being able to apply those real-life situations um, just puts it into uh, more uh, concrete examples and things like that. It's, it's able for them to understand it a little bit more. And then making connections that your students can can. Um, grasp. So when I think about teaching ecology, one of the things that we do to talk about ecosystems, the very first thing is we talk about what is your ecosystem. So let's talk about all of the people and the things that make up our school and then connecting that to the bigger picture and, and being able to talk about, well, what happens if something leaves our ecosystem? And then the students make that that bigger connection, that bigger picture of, oh, everything's affected. Um, looking at um, things that they might encounter. So on uh, the picture on the bottom left, they're playing marbles. So this is a game that they've they've played in the past or that they're familiar with or um, toys, that, that thing in the middle where they're using the ball and the um, slinky. Th these are all things that they've had their hands on. And so taking their context and putting it into an educational setting to talk again about physics. And then in the left hand corner, we have two students making a roller coaster and applying physics on along that lines. So really looking at bigger picture, 
then how can you make connections to the real world as well as put it into a context that your students can grasp or that they already understand. And that's how I teach abstract thinking in my classroom. From the examples, we can see that computer science unplugged approach has a lot of benefits and potentials in teaching students computer science concepts and develop their computational thinking skills. The benefits include teaching away from computers. It is a simple and engaging way to introduce computational thinking. It provides a play space where students can experiment with ideas and construct their own knowledge. It is accessible to a variety of students with different backgrounds and learning styles. It also supports teachers in teaching problem solving and computational thinking skills by using simple classroom manipulatives. The approach also demonstrates that computer science is not about using computers, but exploring its fundamental concepts. As more and more teachers are beginning to integrate computer science and computational thinking into their curriculum, the computer science unplugged approach might be a good beginning to engage students in learning computer science and developing their computational thinking skills. Thank you for watching the video. If you are looking to receive contact hours, please follow the link in the description of each video.